You are listening to the podcast of New Life Church in Wayland, Michigan. Our longing is to see zero people in our community living unchanged by Jesus. We are a church navigating the messiness of life together in community. One of our core convictions is that everyone is welcome, no one is perfect, and anything is possible. I hope you know there is a place in the family for you here. For more information on gathering times and location, check out our website, newlifewayland.org. But for now, I hope God speaks powerfully to you through this word. Well, good morning. Good morning. How is everyone doing this morning? Good. My name is Brad. I serve as one of the pastors here at New Life. And I want to invite you uh, to open your Bibles with me this morning to Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. Isaiah 6, 1 through 8. And as you're turning there, as you're uh, opening your phone to get there, uh, we're in a series right now, week two of a series called Fear Over Faith, where we are looking at a good kind of fear, the kind of fear that we are called to as the people of God in Scripture, which is a fear of the Lord. So Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim, each had six wings, with two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, This has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin is atoned for. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, Here I am. Send me. Will you pray with me as we dive into God's word together? Father, we thank you for the good news that is in this word this morning. God, we thank you that you are a God who is Holy, holy, holy. And so, God, with that in our minds and our hearts right now, God, we we come to you with reverence and with awe and with fear, acknowledging who you are and who we are. God, as your whole as you promise, your Holy Spirit says your word will not return void, that it it will make a difference in our lives. And so we pray that over all of us this morning, God, that we will walk away more formed in the image of your son, Jesus, because of your word this morning. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So it's been about 15 years since I've purchased a diamond for an engagement ring. And I remember the day very, very well when I went into the jewelry shop looking at all of the different options for diamonds. And I, believe it or not, this is not the diamond I purchased. Uh, This is one that has been enlarged to show texture. Uh, But when you look at diamonds, maybe you've gone through this process before, they kind of highlight the different characteristics of diamonds, right? The four C's, cut, clarity, color, uh, and carrot. And uh, they'll kind of show you the different options. And then when you start to hone in on one, I'll never forget what they did. They took out a black piece of velvet or like one of those black folders and they lay it out on the glass and they allow you to examine the diamond in the ring against the backdrop of the black velvet. And as you look, the way the lights hit the stone, I mean, it just dances and glimmers and it convinces you to spend way more than is reasonable on a rock that came out of the earth. All the men in the room who are married said amen to that. And uh, I, I just wonder, like, why, why do they take out that black piece of velvet? Why do they take out that black cloth? In fact, I wore a black shirt to uh, kind of highlight that here this morning. Why do they take out the black piece of cloth? It's for the contrast, 
right? They, they want you to look at this diamond, this ring against the black backdrop so that the diamond dances, so that it comes alive in the light. The, the black cloth creates the contrast, you won't fully appreciate the brilliance of the diamond until you see the contrast. Experiencing God as he truly is always creates a contrast. Always. You see, the black cloth is the way in which lostness and the fear and the anxiety and the sin that grips this world. And, and if we're honest, so many of us in the church in ways that taint our witness, that's a black backdrop. And the diamond is God's holiness, his set-apartness, his otherness. That there is a contrast between who we are and who he is. And the problem is that many of us have gotten really comfortable living without that contrast. And so what we end up doing is we end up making God in our image we approach him flippantly or we don't approach him at all. We don't realize how different God is from us. And so we kind of project ourselves onto him. He must have the same beliefs that I have. He must dislike the same people that I like, or he must live with the same anxiety of the future that I, I carry in me. There's no way God has plans for my life or even concepts of plans for my life. That was a debate joke. It's the only one, I promise. We can laugh at ourselves a little bit, okay? We assume that he is surprised when another person lets him down, just like we're surprised when people let us down, or that the same bitterness that develops in my bones towards another person also lives in him, his. We, we project ourselves onto God when we don't live out of this contrast, when we don't understand how distinct he is from us. We forget that even exposure to his holy, holy, holiness can kill a man. Too many of us, we live without this contrast. A.W. Tozer, he once famously said that the most important thing about a person is what he thinks about when he thinks about God. The most important thing about a person is what comes to mind when we think about God. And, and the reason that we are spending a whole month talking about the fear of the Lord is because the fear of the Lord is a contrast an awe, a reverence between who he is and who I am against his holiness. To fear God is to see the diamond set against the cloth. And so what I want to do this morning is I want to take a look at Isaiah 6. And I will just tell you, few passages of scripture have set my heart free over this last year more than Isaiah 6 has. I mean, this has, this has been a, a passage that I've wanted to preach on for the last 10 months. This message has been living in my bones. So I'm excited for this morning. Are you guys excited? Yes! Awesome. That's pretty, three of us are excited. I love it. Let's do it. All right. Isaiah 6, uh, chapter, or verse 1. I forgot a slide here. We're going to go back a second. ADD, squirrel. Um... <laughs> So before we jump in here, there's a, a guy named Leonard Ravenhill. He was a British evangelist and revivalist. He says this passage right here, Isaiah 6, can be boiled down to three words that kind of summarize it. And what we're going to do is we're going to wor work through these three words together. So what are the three words? The three words are woe, low, and go. Woe, low, and go, which sounds kind of like a hip-hop beat, if we're honest. Like, woe, low, go, you know, yo. I'm not going to quit my day job. <laughs> Three words, woe, low, go. Let's take a look at woe uh, together here first. Verse one, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up. Now this feels like kind of a random way to start this vision. In the year that a king died, that's, that's kind of weird. Why would Isaiah reference King Uzziah in his vision of God on the throne? Well, it makes sense if you understand who King Uzziah was. In fact, you can read about his story in 2 Chronicles 26. We're not going to go there today, but let me just give you a breakdown of who King Uzziah was. He was a king of the southern kingdom of Judah, and under his kingship, his people flourished. Economics were incredible. He expanded agricultural agriculture in some really powerful ways. 
The well system and access to drinking water flourished under him. He was a strong military leader. In fact, the military boundaries expanded under his leadership. The military was strong. Everything about King Uzziah's reign was the things that we tend to celebrate in our political leaders. People flourished under his reign, and and it describes him as, as one who prospers because he sought the Lord. This is King Uzziah. But King Uzziah's story is not ultimately a victory story. It's actually a tragedy story. Because all of that success, all of that fame and power ended up going to his head. And we don't know anything about that for our leaders at all. All of it went to his head. And what he ended up doing, this is just, this is crazy to me. He ended up as a king going into the temple of God and burning an incense coal for his own sin and the sin of his people. Now, what is wrong with that? What's wrong with that is that that was not the king's role. That was a role set aside for the priest, for a mediator between God and his people. That was not Uzziah's role. And so what Uzziah ends up experiencing is leprosy. And this guy whose story starts out so good and so powerful and so successful ends his life in isolation as a leper. You see, Uzziah lived without a contrast between him and who God was. He didn't have reverence for God's holiness. He didn't have this awe and wonder. He flippantly walked into the temple and took a role that wasn't his. And so it makes a lot of sense that Isaiah would say at the start of the story, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the eternal king high and lifted up on a throne. You see the contrast that Isaiah is painting here between earthly kings false hope put in political parties, idolatry of leaders. It took the death of hope in a political leader for Isaiah to see the eternal king high and lifted up. This is point one. This isn't really a three-point. Well, I guess it is a three-point sermon because we'll go, but point one is something always has to die in us if we want to see the glory of the Lord. Always. Something always has to die in us if we want to truly encounter the holiness of God. Some of us are not encountering the holiness of God because the very thing keeping us from him, we have not put to death yet in our lives. What needs to be put to death in you? Is there an area of pride in your heart? Like King Uzziah, where your heart is lifted up, where you're making more of yourself than you ought? Is there an area of comparison or bitterness or self-righteousness living in you? What needs to die in you in order to see the king seated on a throne? Is there a place where you're putting too much false hope right now? By the way, I'm, I'm preaching to myself before I'm preaching to anybody else here. Is there an area of anxiety or fear gripping your heart that needs to be put to death? Maybe for you it's fear of an outcome at work fear of an election, fear of a death of a dream? Is there a sin pattern in your life that needs to be put to death? The the point is every single one of us have something that we need to put to death if we want to see God as he truly is. What is it for you? I want to literally right now give you some time to just raise your hand and tell us all. No, I'm just kidding. (laughs) Sorry. Uh, I want to just give you some time right now Um, To just take 20 seconds and silently name that before the Lord. I'm just going to be quiet for a few seconds here. And just what needs to be put to death in me, God? Bring that before the Lord right now. When false messiahs let us down, or the end of a dream happens, or something dies, there is always an opportunity for us to see God as he really is and to see ourselves as we really are. And this is exactly what happens for Isaiah, reading on in verse 2 through 5 here. This is what it says. It says, Above him, this king on the throne, stood the seraphim, Each had six wings. With two, he covered his face. 
And with two, he covered his feet, and with two, he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, what's that next word there? Woe. That's where we get the woe from. Woe is me, for I am lost. Other translations say, for I am undone. I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. So I want you to picture the scene for a moment. It's kind of a strange scene, if we're honest here. It's, it's kind of some weird imagery happening. But you have these, these angels or these seraphim, which literally means burning ones. So get this image of fire in your mind, burning ones. And they have six wings, and with two wings, they're covering their faces. Scholars believe this is pointing us back to when God told Moses that no man can see my face and live. And with two wings, these seraphim are covering their feet, which scholars believe is pointing back to what we talked about last week, where Moses encounters God at a burning bush, and he says, take off your shoes for the ground that you're standing on is holy. So they're covering their feet, and then with two wings, they're flying. And their eternal refrain over the King of kings and the Lord of lords is holy, holy, holy. Notice, they are in the very place where Uzziah tried to take on the role of priest. They're in the temple. And Isaiah describes this king whose train fills the temple, representing his glory and his honor and his majesty. And I I find it interesting that Isaiah sees these seraphim declaring these words over, over this king, And the words the seraphim uses, use are holy, holy, holy. I think if some of us were to describe God, the first word we use may not be holy, holy, holy. Some of us, the first word we use may be love, love, love. Would that be untrue? No, not at all. For some of us, the first word that we might use is grace, 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 or mercy, mercy, mercy. But why do these angels say holy, holy, holy? Because if you remove the contrast, if you remove the holiness and how different and separate and other this king on this throne is from who we are in our lostness, in our darkness, his love loses all power. His mercy and grace fall flat. Holy, holy, holy is what creates the contrast that we need to see God clearly. See, in this moment, Isaiah is brutally hit with awareness. Wow. Woe is me. I'm not like him. Have you ever received that brutal gift of awareness when you didn't want it? (laughs) I got one yesterday. I was waiting in line at the car wash. Oh man, this is embarrassing. Um, And my son was in the back seat and we were chatting and I was like sort of paying attention to what I was doing and my car was like slowly moving forward and all of a sudden crunch, I hit the person in front of me and it's like that gut punch, like, oh, first of all, I suck. That's not fun. But it's like that brutal gift of awareness that like, I'm all of a sudden awoken to the things that are happening around me. It's like this this gut punch moment. And we all know what those gut punch moments feel like in our lives. By the way, don't go to a car wash with me. I'm I'm dangerous in those settings. But we all know what those, those gut punch moments feel like. And this is what will happen when you get a clear glimpse of how holy God is. It's like this gut punch. Woe is me. I am undone. You see, for Isaiah, it's like not only is Uzziah unclean, but so am I. And not only am I unclean, but so are we. I dwell among a people of unclean lips. All of us. All of us are the black backdrop when it comes to his holiness. Which makes what happens next in the story absolutely mind-blowing. Because Isaiah in this moment should have died. He should have been done for. But watch what happens as we go to the second word here, the second word is low. Whoa, low, go, yo. <laughs> um, check it out, verse six and seven. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, 
having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, behold. Now this word behold, uh, in the ESV, more modern translation says behold. In the KJV, the King James Version, it's this word lo, L-O. Uh, not really a word we use much anymore, but all it means is look, pay attention to, become aware of, behold. This has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin is atoned for. See, God doesn't want us to just have an awareness of his holiness and stay in this woe is me place. He actually provides a way out of this woe is me place. He provides us a path out of our lostness and our uncleanness by atonement, by way of his sacrifice. I want you to notice something really important here, though. What does Isaiah do in order for his sin to be atoned for? Absolutely nothing. He doesn't do anything. This is another contrast between him and King Uzziah. He doesn't say, hey, God, can you atone for my sin? Or how can I do this? To, or what can I do to get that coal to touch my mouth? You don't see him do anything to try to earn atonement for himself. Nothing. Which is such a contrast to King Uzziah who used what to atone for himself? A coal. Again, there's this contrast where the seraphim comes and he touches Isaiah's lips and he says, behold, your guilt is taken away and your sin is atoned for, not because of who you are, but because of the one who sits on this throne. See, it's God's holiness that makes you aware of how much you need his grace. And if you lose sight of his holiness, you actually lose sight of how much you need his grace. Isaiah himself, later on in the story, in Isaiah 64, says, Even my best, even the best I have to offer, my most righteous deeds are but filthy rags before you. Again, there's this contrast. Some of you, and you're limping into this new school year. Maybe you've gone backwards to old habits, old addictions, old ways of self-medicating, old sin patterns that you thought you had kind of left behind. We, we tend to drift to those places, don't we? And you're just like, God, like, what is happening? And I, I think there's two unhealthy places that we can get stuck when those types of things happen. The first one is we say, woe is me, and we stay in woe is me. That I'm just a victim that the way it's always been is the way it's always going to be, that nothing will ever change, and this is just the way it is, that's a place of staying stuck. That's not the gospel. But then the other thing that we do is, is we say, okay, it's all up to me to fix this. I got to pull up myself by my own bootstraps. I got to burn my own coals on the altar. I got to do this and go through these motions, and I got to fix this, and it's all on me. Neither of these is the gospel, the gospel is that there was one who atoned for you on your behalf. Amen. That a coal has touched your lips through the person of Jesus dying on the cross to atone for your sins. And that is our pathway out, my friends. Amen. And I think the third word that is used in this text is the key to freedom for some of us this morning. See, there's a woe and there's a low. And then there's a go, that the redeemed man is actually sent on the move towards lost people. Check it out in this last verse, verse 8 here. It says, And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? Who shall go for us? Then I said, Here I am, send me. I love verse 8 because the end goal of your redemption in Jesus is never just for you. It's for others. It's for lost people around you. What happens in Isaiah's life is he is confronted with his own lostness. Woe is me, there's something different, there's a contrast. But then in the process of redemption, he is commissioned and he is sent to move towards the lostness of other people. See, I think if when we stay in these places of woe is me or I got to fix this all by myself, what we end up doing is we keep all of the attention on us. But the gospel, maturing Christians, maturing followers of Jesus don't have all of our eyes on ourselves. Our eyes begin to turn out towards other people. 
We begin to see the lostness of other people. It begins to break our hearts like it breaks God's, and we become people on the move. And Isaiah 6 is such a powerful chapter. We're not going to read the rest of it, but the rest of Isaiah 6 is basically just God telling Isaiah, this calling on your life is going to be really, really dang hard. You're going to speak to really stubborn people that don't want to hear what you say. Your message is going to fall on deaf ears. At one point in this text, Isaiah says, how long, oh Lord? Like, how long do I have to preach the gospel to these idiots? That was not me speaking, by the way. It's Isaiah speaking. Man, it's nice knowing you guys. Um, sometimes we get tripped up on the go part of it. Sometimes we get really stuck on the go part of it. Um, and so we kind of live in this stuck place. And we say things like, man, they're, they're never going to receive what you have for them, God. Their hearts are hardened. There's a go on your life. Or I was thrown a curveball. I wasn't expecting this, God. Like my circumstance, my experience right now doesn't look like what I thought it was going to be. There's a go on your life. Or it's just taking forever. Why does it take so long? There is a go on, the, on your life. See, what I want you to hear this morning is that Isaiah's experience of God points us to a true and better Isaiah. One who was also in the throne room that day. Have you ever wondered who Isaiah saw seated on the throne that day? John, the gospel of John actually tells us who Isaiah saw seated on the throne that day. John chapter 12, verse 41 says that Isaiah saw Jesus on the throne that day and he wrote about it and he spoke about it. Jesus is the one seated on the throne that day. You know, A.W. Tozer says, what you think about when you think about God is the most important thing about you. C.S. Lewis actually came in after A.W. Tozer wrote that and disagreed with A.W. Tozer. He said, I believe that there's actually something more important about you than what you think about when you think about God. What did C.S. Lewis believe is the most important thing about you? It's what God thinks of you. What God thinks of you. Picture yourself in that throne room. Picture yourself as one of the seraphim, forever singing holy, holy, holy to Jesus. And then picture the day that that king got up off that throne. He stood up and began walking. As a seraphim, maybe you would ask, Jesus, what, what are you doing? Where are you going? And you hear Jesus say, the Father is sending me to go live with them. What kind of objections would you have in that moment? You respond to how, Jesus, they are wicked. They are wicked, and you are holy, holy, holy. How, Jesus, your glory fills the whole earth. Your train fills the temple. How are you going to become one of, or how are you going to go live among them, Jesus? You shake the foundations of the temple. You place the foundations of the earth. The earth is your footstool. How? They can't even see your face and live. How are you going to go live among them, Jesus? To which he says, I'm going to become one of them. I'm going to become one of them. Ordinary, inhuman, but completely holy still. And I'm going to touch their uncleanness with my holiness. I'm going to heal their sicknesses. I'm going to redeem their souls. I'm going to be beat and mocked and killed on a cross for them but I'm not going to stay dead. I'm going to rise again three days later. And I imagine the Savior, like, why would you do this, Jesus? Why would you get up off your throne and do this? You're, you're holy, holy, holy. They are not. I love them. See, the angels cried holy, holy, holy that day as a way to point us to how deep and wide and profound his love and grace actually is for each and every one of us. That is why it is important for us to live with the contrast. You see, friends, Jesus is the diamond of heaven who came down into a dark, black, broken, hurting world. And Isaiah's experience with Jesus shows us what our experience of Jesus ought to look like. So let's put those three words up there one more time. Woe, low, go. Whoa, God is holy, and I am utterly lost apart from him. 
I am undone. I am a man of unclean lips. I dwell among a people of unclean lips. I have pride and fear and sin, and I kind of mess up some of the things that I touch, and I tend to worship false gods and all of these things. Woe is me. And then there's a low. He has provided a way out of my lostness through the cross that those who call on the name of Jesus will be saved. And then go. I am called to move towards the lostness of others. Woe, low, go. This is the rhythm of the Christian life. So what I want to do is, um, you may know this about our church, you may not, but uh, our vision statement as a church, like the thing that we are going after, the thing that keeps us up at night, the thing that we are running towards and longing for is, is this right here, that we are not done as a church until zero people remain unchanged by Jesus. This is an Isaiah-type vision for the church, that we are not done until zero people remain unchanged by Jesus. And you know who the first person that matters most for? It's for you. But then what happens is as Jesus begins to transform you and change you, you are called on a go towards other people. You're called to people. So as you read this statement here, who do you think about when you hear this vision? What's that name that comes to mind for you? This is an Isaiah-like vision because God first confronts the lostness in me and then he moves me towards the lostness of others. When I... When I see this vision statement, I think about my great aunt, Carol. My great aunt, Carol, um, grew up in the same home as my grandfather. And they grew up in a pretty, pretty rough home environment. There was some really profound mental illness in their home, substance abuse in their home. At one point, uh, my grandpa actually had to work as a young kid to provide all the kind of money and stuff for his family because he had parents that couldn't work. And they ended up losing their sister to dr- their other sister to drowning in Lake Michigan at age 13. So my Aunt Carol knows what a hard life feels like. And my grandpa knows what a hard life feels like. And, and as they grow up, eventually what happens is my grandpa gets saved as an adult. He trusts in Jesus and gives his life to Jesus. But my Aunt Carol, man, her heart calcifies towards God. All of her experiences and all of her pain and all of the loss that she's experienced is just solidified towards God and her heart is hardened and she wants nothing to do with them. Add to that, she loses a son to suicide. There's abuse in her family and it just continues to get more hard and more hard towards God. And my grandfather spent his entire adult life praying for his sister. He never stopped sharing the gospel with her. I I heard stories of how my grandparents would send Aunt Carol Christmas cards in the mail. And if there was ever a scripture on that Christmas card, what Carol would do is she would mail it right back to them because she wanted nothing to do with Jesus, nothing to do with God. And my grandfather prayed for and evangelized to and witnessed to his sister till the day he died, March 10, 2024, just a few months ago. And he never got to see the salvation of his sister. Ever. But the Holy Spirit didn't stop moving in my Aunt Carol's life. You see, at my grandfather's funeral, I had the opportunity to preach the gospel. And what I didn't know at the time is that through my grandpa's testimony and the way that she was able to hear it in that moment, the Holy Spirit started softening her heart. And then my mom told me she went to another funeral a few weeks later and heard the gospel presented again and different people coming around her and surrounding her life. And just a couple weeks ago, my grandma, this is no joke, she received a handwritten card in the mail from my Aunt Carol. And it was filled with encouragement. And what my Aunt Carol had done is she just wrote out scripture after scripture after scripture. The woman who used to send cards back is now sending a card with scripture in it. And I share that story because this is personal for me. And and my Aunt Carol is still a work in progress, as am I, as are you. God is still working things out in all of our lives. But where is this personal for you? Where is this personal for you? Is there a name that comes to mind? 
You know, when I think about this vision that we all play a part in of zero people remaining unchanged by Jesus, I think about my great aunt Carol. I think about my barber. I think about my tattoo artist who I talk with Jesus about all the time. I think about family members I've been praying for for years and friends and the barista at the coffee shop who's 35 years old who just got diagnosed with cancer that I go to and uh, I have a, a card of hers on my dashboard of my car and every single time I see it I just stop to pray for her as she's going through chemotherapy as a 35 year old woman where is this personal for you who comes to mind when you see this vision for you and for me for some of you, I think, this is what God wants to do. Some of you are here and, man, you know Carol's life. Your heart is calcified towards the Lord. Experience after experience has just solidified that for you. And what God wants you to see here this morning is that the diamond of heaven came into your world for you. And that Jesus Christ took on the burden of sin and shame and lostness and fear and anxiety and all of the things that we do that separate ourselves from God. He said, I want to become like you so you can become like me. If you're here and you have not received that hope yet this morning, you've never trusted in Jesus, I want to invite you into a woe, low, go pattern right now. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to invite you just to pray alongside me quietly in your heart as I pray this out loud. Just repeat the words after me in your own heart. And I want to invite you this morning to receive this free gift of salvation that Jesus offered, not because of your holiness or your righteousness, but because of his offered for you. Let's pray together. Jesus, you are holy, holy, holy and I am not. Jesus, I know that I am a sinner. I know that I can be prone to selfishness, pride, fear, anxiety, all of these things, Lord. And this morning, I bring them before you. And I invite you to do a work in me. Jesus, I believe that you died on the cross so that I could walk in freedom. Jesus, I believe you provide a way out of sin and shame and darkness. And so today, I take hold of that life. I believe you died on the cross and I believe you were raised again so that I could have new life in you. So Jesus, thank you. In your name I pray. Amen. I want to just ask you to keep your eyes closed for just a moment longer here and, and heads bowed. And if you're here and, and you prayed that prayer, I want to just invite you to slip your hand up where you are right now. Just slip it up so I can pray for you here this morning. You see hands around the room. God bless you. Yes. God bless you. Yeah. Man, God is good. Um, you guys can go ahead and open your eyes and I want to invite you to stand and we're going to respond in worship here this morning. And as we respond, we actually have a gift for you if you slipped up your hand here this morning. Uh, we have these cards held in place by these diamonds, not real diamonds, uh, these diamonds around the room at the communion tables. If you slipped up your hand just now and God is stirring something in your heart, I want to ask you to do something for him during this next song. Uh, to go make your way to one of those tables. Simply take two minutes to fill out the car there and then bring it up and drop it in the front basket here as we sing. And then this diamond is yours to take home as a symbol of what you've decided here and what God has done in you this morning. So the, the floor is open. Let's respond in worship. And if that's you, I want to invite you to make your way up uh, to any of the tables and fill out these cards. Let's worship together.